To set up a game of Kamisama, you'll start with the Farming Village tile, attach the Holy Village tile, followed by the Fishing Village, and the Wealthy Village. This will give you a circular board on which the game will be played. Near the board, set up the scoring track. Place the year token on the year one space at the top then of the Then set up track. the four villager decks, starting with the farming village, adding the wealthy village, the fishing village, finally the holy village. You will also place the 48 village tokens, 12 from each village, next to the score track and villager cards. Draw two goal cards randomly from the goal card deck, then draw one of the four random year one goal cards to complete the goal deck. Turn the year one goal face up, to give you your starting goal for the first year of the game. Each player will draw two random Kami character boards and choose one to play, returning the other to the box. After selecting their Kami, each player will take 18 shrines in their player color, five action cubes in their chosen player color, setting three aside to be used in the first round and keeping two in reserve. Players will gain one additional cube each year, one yellow favor disc, and one green nature disc. These discs will be used to track favor and nature as play progresses. Every Kami in the game has their own unique special abilities that only that Kami or that player will be using throughout the course of gameplay. Every Kami has the ability to add or remove a shrine in their current village, as indicated on the spaces here. All of the other abilities on the board are specific to that particular Kami. So in the case of Hala that we are looking at now, Hala has a passive ability called Cultivate which lets her gain one nature after she adds a shrine to a field in her current village. And this will make more sense as we take a look at the board. Her first ability, Burgeon, says to add shrines to two adjacent huts or stilt houses in your current village. Choose an opponent and they may add a shrine in a field in any village or can gain one favor. When Hala chooses to harvest, she will remove one of her shrines in a field in the current village to remove up to two shrines in the current village. Opponents with shrines removed in this way will gain one favor. And Hala's Flourish ability at the bottom of the card, which requires two, action, two of her action cubes to activate, allows uh, that player to replace an opponent's shrine in a field or a temple in any village. You may exchange one village token for one that corresponds to that village. And again, that will make more sense as we take a look at the gameplay. If we look at a different Kami, in this case Shize, the Kami of the Wind, you will notice that the board looks exactly the same with the favor and nature track along the top, the same add and remove ability uh, to the current village on the left hand side, but you will notice that all of the abilities on the center of the board have changed. Shize's passive ability, the Western Wind, the first time you remove a shrine in any village, you may move a shrine in your current village to another village. Shize also has the ability to gust, uh, call up the winds of change, or call forth a tornado. So these abilities are different for Shize as opposed to the ones that we just looked at with Hala. And all eight Kami in the base game, as well as any expansions, uh, will have different abilities in each of these spaces. Going back to the board, there's one other step to complete. After you've chosen the first player, and that is done randomly, if that first player is not already seated in the wedge facing the farming village, rotate the board or re rearrange seats so that the first player is sitting next to the farming village. Place the blue advent token on the farming village and place the red advent token off of the board still adjacent to the farming village in front of the first player. These two tokens will be used to indicate how many rounds have been completed so far in the year and will indicate when the end of year has arrived. Each village in Kamisama is made up of a number of types of spaces, each space giving you a different benefit. Placing a shrine in a forest space, or any of these spaces with the pink cherry blossom areas, allows you to gain two nature, meaning you would simply tick your nature track up two spaces at the top of your player board. Placing a shrine in any of the field spaces, so these rice patties that you see on the board, allows you to gain two favor for placing that shrine, so again, you would tick your favor track up two. When you place your shrine in the temple space, each village has one temple space, when you place there, you get to choose one favor or one nature, ticking up accordingly. Placing your shrines inside the hut spaces, or these yellow roofed structures, has no immediate benefit, but will come into effect at the end of the year when determining area control and who gets first pick of the villagers that you're drafting. Placing in the stilt houses, or these gray roof structures that are near the water, also have no immediate effect, 
but come into effect for some of the Kami abilities, as well as also determining uh, area control when it comes to drafting villagers at the end of the year. On a player's turn, that player will use their available action cubes. In the first year, each player will have three action cubes. They will spend those cubes to activate their Kami abilities, as well as the common ability of adding or removing a shrine in the current village. To do so, simply take one of your action cubes, place it in the space you wish to activate, and do that ability. So placing where I just placed, I would get to add or remove a shrine in any space in my current village. My current village is the farming village, so I could pick any spot to add one of my shrines. So let's say I add to this field. Adding to a field allows me to gain two favor, and Hala's special ability also allows her to gain one nature when she places in a field. So it helps her keep those tracks a little bit more balanced. Other Kami, when they go to the field, only gain the two favor. If I place a second cube, I can choose to place in this stilt house, and I can use my third cube to just do a regular ability and place my third, my third shrine here. This gives me three shrines in a, in a horizontal line, which matches the pattern for year number one, and would grant Hala the corresponding village token, in this case, the farming village. These village tokens are important because at the end of the game, they are each worth one victory point, and if at any time Hala has collected a set of all four village tokens, they can immediately be cashed in to score six victory points. Alternatively, Hala has the ability to use her own special abilities that are unique to her Kami character card. So I could place a cube, like I did before, in order to add a shrine to a field, giving me two favor and granting one nature. I could then choose to use Hala's Burgeon ability, which allows Hala to add shrines to two adjacent huts or stilt houses in the current village, and then she would choose an opponent that would get to add a shrine uh, to a field in any village, which would give them two favor, or if there are no fields available, they would simply gain one favor. So she's gonna use that Burgeon ability, uh, ability to place two shrines in neighboring huts or stilt houses, giving her the pattern and giving her the farming village token that she has acquired because she's completed the pattern. She still has one cube left. So she has the ability to either add another shrine to uh, just add or remove a shrine. She also has the ability to use her harvest ability, which would let her remove a shrine from the field to remove other shrines. Probably not something she wants to do at this point because she's the only she's the only person that has shrines in this village at this point. So we're simply going to use the add remove and we're going to add down here to this forest, giving us to nature. So you see her options are become a little bit more open if she starts to use her abilities more as opposed to using just the standard add or remove shrine ability. After Hala is done taking her actions in the farming village, Play continues to the left to the player in the wealthy village who can do the exact same thing, placing cubes to take actions on their player mat. It is now Shize's turn, or the player in the wealthy village. For demonstration purposes, Shize's player card is laying on the game board. That obviously would not be happening during the game. So Shize will take her actions, and let's say Shize just simply places her three action cubes on the add or remove a shrine in the current village, and she places three shrines one in the field, and then one in each of these hut spaces. This will allow her to again complete the same pattern of having three shrines horizontally. Now looking here, they're vertical, but as she's looking at it, the pattern matches. So she would gain the corresponding village token, in this case, the wealthy village token. And placing in the field also gives her two favor. Play then moves left again, clockwise, to the fishing village, in this case, Ginsui, our death kami. Ginsui can take his turns again, same way, placing action cubes, so place there to add a shrine. So we'll add a shrine down here to this forest, giving to nature. We will use a second cube to place a second shrine, and then we'll use the third cube to place a third shrine. Again, completing our pattern for this round and granting Ginsui with the Fishing Village token. Play then moves to the Holy Village and Mizuchi, our Kami spirit, or our river spirit. Mizuchi places a cube, which allows her to place a shrine in a field, so she gains two favor. Her passive ability allows her to place shrines using the basic add or remove shrine ability. She can add or remove shrines from river houses in any village. 
So normally this add remove ability is only to the current village. So normally she would only be able to affect the, the holy village that she's currently working in. But because of her ability, she could come in here, play her cube in the regular shrine and she could, or in the regular space and she could add a shrine in the fishing village because in the stilt house in the fishing village because that's what her passive ability allows her to do. She's gonna stay in her own village though because she has plans. And then for her third action, she will simply take her, sh her shrine and place it in the temple in the holy village, granting her the ability to choose one favor or one nature, and she will take one nature because she already has two favor at this point. That is the end of Mizuchi's turn. At the end of Mizuchi's turn, the board rotates a quarter turn clockwise. So you'll notice now the shrines that Hala placed are now one village to her left. The shrines that Mizuchi just placed, Mizuchi just placed are now in front of Hala. Play will now resume as normal with Hala taking her turn, except now Hala is affecting the village that is now in front of her. So in this case, Hala is working in the Holy Village. Mizuchi, who was just in the Holy Village, is now working in the Fishing Village. Ginsui, who was in the Fishing Village, is now working in the Wealthy Village. And Hala uh, was in the Farming Village. That Farming Village has now moved to the left and is now being played by Shize. Hala will remove her action cubes, resetting her board, but she'll leave her favor in nature set where it was pr during her or from her previous plays. That does not change until the end of the year. So she will place again. We're going to add a shrine to a field because it benefits us. Uh, actually, we're going to put it in the forest. That's going to give her two nature. We're going to use her burgeon ability again allowing her to place a shrine in neighboring huts or stilt houses. So she will do this. This gives her a complete straight line in the Holy Village, which is going to give her the Holy Village token to add to her player board, or at least to her player area. And she has one cube available to use. She will place that here and add a shrine to this field, granting her two more favor and one more nature. So you can see Hala's abilities allow her to climb up that nature track really, really quickly. Play continues to the left with Shize, now playing in the farming village where Hala affected before. You'll notice the shrines all stayed in place as the board rotated. So Hala can simply place her shrines as normal so she can use to add or remove a shrine in a current village. She wants to go here to gain two more favor. She's going to add a shrine in this hut and finally add a shrine in this hut. Again, completing the pattern for the village and granting her the, farmage the farming village token. So she now has two of the four tokens she needs to complete her set. Play continues to the wealthy village where Shize had placed her shrines, but now it is the turn of Ginsui, our death spirit, to place his shrines or take his actions in his current village. For his first action, he's going to place here and he's simply going to remove one of Shize's shrines using the remove ability. So we pop that shrine off the board and he has the ability or his, his passive ability allows him after he removes an opponent's shrine in your current village, which this is his current village, he gains one favor or one nature. In this case, he's gonna take another nature. So he's gonna climb up that nature track one more. He will then use his two remaining cubes to activate his power ability at the bottom, the final march. Final march, choose one, a hut, stilt house, or a temple, and add a shrine to the corresponding type of space in two different villages. So he's going to use that to add his red shrines in the temples in two separate villages. He's gonna select the temple. Each of those temples grants him one favor or one nature. He's gonna take one favor for each. So one favor for this temple and another favor for this temple, balancing those tracks out a little bit more. Now, he does not have a straight line of three, so he does not get the Wealthy Village token. It is now Mizuchi's turn in the Fishing Village. Mizuchi really wants to complete the goal of having three shrines in a row so that she can gain the Fishing Village token. However, looking at the village, she sees that she's not really going to be able to do that with the abilities at her disposal because she could go in this forest in this hut. However, the third hut is blocked. She would need some kind of replace ability, which currently she doesn't have available to her. So instead, she's decided to just wreak a little havoc. So we're gonna pull her player board over here, cover up the Fishing Village because she's gonna work completely outside of her current village demonstrating how the Kami can do so um, using their abilities. Now again, this is Mizuchi's ability, so Hala, Shize, Gensui do not have the ability to do what I'm about to do. 
Mizuchi is going to use two of her action cubes to activate her Flood ability. Flood says to add a shrine to a stilt house in any village and remove a shrine adjacent to that shrine. So she's going to take one of her shrines, she's going to place it in this stilt house in the holy village and remove this purple shrine that belongs to Hala. That shrine is just given back to the player playing Hala so that it's available to be used on another turn. She is then going to use her Torrent ability, which allows her to replace a shrine, uh, replace an opponent's shrine in a stilt house in any village, and that opponent can add a shrine in that village. So she's going to replace Hala's shrine in this stilt house, and Hala gets the, has the ability to add a shrine to a village, so Hala is going to place in this forest, which is going to grant her to nature as it would if she had placed in that forest on her own turn. The board rotates again now that Mizuchi has taken her turn, and Hala is now in the fishing village, directly across from the farming village where she began the game. And you can tell that two rounds have, have completed because one advent token, the red advent token, is still in front of Hala. However, the blue advent token is all the way over on the other side of the board, across, uh, across from Hala at the table, in this case sitting in the village that Gensui is now playing in. Hala will spend her three actions to take her actions in the fishing village. So maybe she simply uses three actions to add three shrines. She takes the field so that she can take two favor and one nature. She takes this stilt house and she takes this temple so that she gains an additional favor. In this case, favor or nature, her choice, she chooses favor. So that is her ability or her turn this round. The next turn here we have uh, Shize who has the ability to place shrines in her village, in this case her current village is the Holy Village now, where Hala and uh, Mizuchi each have shrines. So Shize is going to come in here. The first time she removes a shrine in her village, according to her passive ability, she can move a shrine in the current village to another village. So she can remove a shrine and then she can basically blow one of the other shrines away. So that's what she's going to do in this case because she has a couple of spaces on the board that she needs and she and, and there are people in, there in her way. So she's going to use um, her remove ability to remove Mizuchi from this space. And this will allow her to move this shrine that belongs to Hala to another village. And she's going to move it over here and stick it just arbitrarily in the middle of this village because Hala doesn't really have a lot of shrines over here already. She will then use another add ability to add a shrine to the forest, giving her two more to nature, putting her on that nature track finally. And then she will use her uh, regular add shrine ability again to add another shrine in uh, the hut there. So she's working toward building that combo, building that pattern that she needs to earn the Holy Village token. We move over to Ginsui up here in the farming village. And for the purposes of this particular turn, I'm not pulling player cards on and off so you can see the map and kind of see how the, how the, the board evolves as players take their turns. Ginsui is going to come in again. He has the ability to remove shrines and gain favor or nature for doing so. Um, so he may do that. And in fact, we're going to remove this shrine and he's going to choose to take a favor. He will then have the ability, um, He'll go ahead and use his regular ability here to place a shrine, just a standard ability, and place in the area where he just removed Hala. And then he'll use his third ability to place another shrine in this stilt house, kind of building out a pattern, building some adjacency out, and trying to help himself out uh, at the end of year scenario. We'll move over, here, move over here to Mizuchi. Mizuchi's gonna take her three actions, and she's gonna use all three of those to just do basic add or remove shrines. So she's gonna add to these three, or these two huts in this one still house, this is going to complete a goal for her and give her the wealthy village token. So now Mizuchi has one of the village tokens as well. Again, each village token is worth one VP at the end of the game, and a full set of four village tokens can be immediately cashed in for six points during the game. So that is everyone's turn, and we will rotate the board again and take the last action of the year. The board has been rotated and it is Hala's turn to play in the Wealthy Village. We know there's only one turn remaining in this round because the red advent token and the blue advent token are only one space away from each other or one wedge away from each other. So when the board rotates again, they will line up signifying the end of the year. Hala is going to use her basic remove shrine ability to remove Shize from this particular hut. 
She will then use her Burgeon ability that she used before, allowing her to place shrines into uh, two adjacent huts or stilt houses. In this case, she's going to place those into these two huts, giving her a line of three and immediately granting her the Wealthy Village token. So Hala now has three of the four tokens that she needs to score six points. She has one ability left. She's simply going to use that ability to place a shrine in this field, granting her another two favor and because of her passive ability, one nature. We move into the fishing village where Shize is. Shize has no shrines here because she has not played in this village yet, which is pretty standard. So what's going to happen here is that Shize is going to use her ability to place three shrines. So she is going to use her ability to place a shrine here. She is going to place a shrine here, granting her two nature, climbing up that nature track. And then she'll use the third ability to simply place in this hut. So again, she doesn't have the three in a row that she needs in order to complete the objective, but she's setting herself up for future turns as well as potentially benefits at the end of the year. Ginsui will use three, uh, his three actions to simply place three of his shrines into available spaces. So we're just going to place these three shrines here, here, and here. Again, not, not gaining a token, but setting himself up for future turns. And then Mizuchi comes here. Mizuchi has some interesting choices to make because this village has become a little bit full with everyone's playing in it, plus some things have happened that have moved some shrines around. So she has an interesting choice to make as far as how she wants to do things. She can place in three random spaces because there are still three spaces available, so she could choose to do that and climb those tracks. And in fact, she's actually going to do that because she wants to replace, or she wants to place in the field to gain two favor. She wants to place in this forest over here to gain two nature. And then she's going to go ahead and place in this field to gain two more favor. And we'll see why she wants to do that here at the end of the year. That being the end of her turn, the board will rotate again, signifying the end of the year. The board is now rotated. The red advent token and the blue advent token are now lined up back in front of the first player, in this case, Hala, signifying the end of the year. So at the end of the year, no one is going to take a turn. Instead, we move to the end of year scoring phase. The first step when doing end of round scoring or end of year scoring is to determine influence in the villages and then draft villagers based on who has the most influence. We always start in the farming village. The farming village, the way, the way we do influence is we take a look at shrines that are chained together orthogonally. They're orthogonally adjacent to one another. Diagonals do not count for this chain for drafting purposes. So we look at this farming village and we have Shize with three shrines in a row. Ginsui has three, sh three shrines that are connected orthogonally. Hala has two, two shrines that are together. And even though Mizuchi has three shrines in the farming village, none of them are adjacent to one another in any way, so her, her chain in this village is effectively a chain of one. And the way, th the way influence determines uh, drafting villagers is we take the villager deck that corresponds to the village we're in. So we're in the farming village, so we were going to take the villager deck, or the, the farming village deck, and we're going to draw the top four cards off of that deck, and we're going to pass those to the player with the most influence in the village. Now, we have Shize and Ginsui that are both tied with three shrines apiece. So there's a tie for most influence. However, Ginsui has placed his shrine in the temple, and the temple is, the, is determined the tiebreaker. So Ginsui gets to choose between the tied players, himself and Shize, who get first pick of villagers. And he's obviously more than likely going to choose himself. Now, the villager cards that we see... Have a, couple of, have a couple of pieces of information on them. First, we have a claim ability. The text that is here happens immediately when the villager is claimed. So in this case, if Ginsui were to choose to take this farmer, he would get to add a shrine to a field in this village, meaning the farming village, which would allow him to complete a goal. And at the end of the game, the farmer is worth two victory points. So that's something to consider. The other options he has available to him are the elder, which would give him a farming village token and is worth two victory points at the end of the game. He could select the hunter, which would let him replace a shrine in a field or forest in this village, also allowing him to complete a goal and also worth two victory points. And the fourth option he has is the peasant. Now peasants are worth half a victory point at the end of the game. Every peasant is worth half a victory point and that's rounded down. So there's no half scoring. So basically every pair of peasants that you have at the end of the game is worth one point and they do not have a claim ability. So they're the weakest of the villagers there, which is a good way or, or good incentive knowing the peasants are in the deck and they're in all four villager decks. 
as well in all four village decks, it's a good incentive to make sure that you're chaining your shrines together so that you don't become last in each village and get stuck with a bunch of peasants that aren't going to give you good in-game points. So looking at his options, uh, Ginsui is simply going to take the Elder and grant his Farming Village token. To take the Farming Village token, he'll add it to his player board, giving him that token. He then passes the cards to the person who has the second most influence. In this case, Shize. So he passes over to Shize. Shize has the same cards to select from, the Farmer, the Hunter, and the Peasant. And she's looking at the, the farming village, even though she's sitting over here in the holy village, she's still looking in the farming village, and she sees that the farmer would allow her to add a shrine to a field in this village, but currently all of the fields are occupied, so that's not a great option for her. So she's going to instead take the hunter, which allows her to add a replace, uh, which allows her to add or replace a shrine in a field or forest, and so she's going to take that card for herself, and she is going to simply replace this Mizuchi shrine in this field with her own shrine and this will grant her two favor for placing in a field. She then passes the cards to the, to the person who has the third most influence. In this case that would be Hala. Hala's choices again are the farmer which allows her to place a shrine in a field even though the fields are occupied. The farmer is worth two victory points or she could choose to take the peasant that's worth a half point at the end of the game. In this case she's going to take the farmer just so she can have the two end game points. And that will take the peasant and pass the peasant over to the Mizuchi player in her player space. Now that we have drafted villagers for the farming village, we move to the left and we draft villagers based on influence in the wealthy village. In the wealthy village, we have Hala with a chain of four shrines. Mizuchi has a chain of three. And then both Gensui and Shize each have a chain of one because they each have a single shrine. So looking at her options here, Hala's going to get first pick. And Hala has the option of going with the... Pull these up here. She has the option of going with the guard, which allows her to choose an opponent and a village. She and that opponent would gain a village token of that chosen village. Kind of a cool ability and uh, two victory points at the end. She could choose to take the Shijin, which grants two nature and two victory points at the end of the game. So if she needed some nature, this is a quick way to get it. She could also take the Noble. This allows her to add a shrine to a hut in this village, and it allows her to where she could complete a goal uh, in this way if she's able to add to a hut. Now, if we're looking, at the, looking up here at the wealthy village, all of the huts, all of these yellow roofed structures are all filled in, so she wouldn't be able to add a hut, but the Noble is worth two victory points at the end of the game. And the fourth option that she has is to take a peasant. So the, the peasant is again shown up. And so looking at her options, uh, she likes the option of, of the guard and being able to take a village token, but would also mean having to give a village token to a neighbor or to one of her opponents. And she doesn't want to do that. So instead, she's going to select and take the noble. Even though she can't add a shrine to a hut, it's still worth two victory points. So that's simply going to go into her player area and will be held on to for end game scoring. She now takes the cards and passes these cards to Mizuchi, who is in second place with a chain of three shrines. So Mizuchi takes a look at the cards, and she gets a little excited because the guard got passed to her. So she, and she wants village tokens because she doesn't have many at this point. So she's going to take the guard, and she's going to go ahead and select the wealthy village that she's in because she does not have the wealthy village token. And she sees that Hala does have the wealthy village token, so it doesn't help Hala build a set. So she's going to select Hala and the wealthy village, and both she and Hala are going to each gain one wealthy village token apiece. So we'll place those on their player mats. Cards then get passed to the next player in line. Now we have a, we currently have a tie between Ginsui and Shize, each with a shrine apiece. Ginsui is again in the temple, so he's going to get first pick. He will most likely pick himself. And he will take the Shijin, which grants him two nature. So he's going to bump up his nature track by two, and it's worth two victory points at the end of the game. The remaining card are the lovely peasant from the wealthy village, gets passed over to Shize, and gets added to her player area for end game scoring. We now move to the fishing village, and looking at the shrines, we have Ginsui with a chain of three, Shize with a chain of three, Hala has a chain of two, and Mizuchi is not in the village. So we move to the fishing village. We take the top four cards of the fishing village because we have four players here. And you have Ginsui with three shrines and Shize with three shrines. So they are tied. The player in the temple determines the tie. So this is where it gets interesting because in the temple, we have Hala, who is not involved in the tie 
but she still gets to determine who goes first. She determines the, the tiebreaker. So she could pick her favorite player, you know, her best friend over her spouse, or uh, you know, she could go with the person she likes better. She could look at the score track and pick the person who's furthest behind, so she's not helping out the leader any further. But in this case, she is going to choose to go with Ginsui and our red player, and she's going to hand him the four cards from the fisherman from the fishing village deck. Those cards are the fisherman, which is going to allow the player to add a shrine to a stilt house in the village. And you can complete a goal. Looking in the fishing village, there are two stilt houses that are open. These gray roof structures that are here. There's one here and one here. So you could place there. I'm not going to let you complete a goal, but the fisherman is worth two victory points at the end of the game. Also have the option of taking the geisha, which is going to gain one favor and is worth a victory point. We have another fisherman that was drawn in here. And then we have the lovely peasant has made another appearance. So in this case, Ginsu is going to take the fisherman, which is going to allow him to add a, a shrine to a stilt house in the fishing village, and it'll be worth two points. So he's simply going to take one of his shrines, pop it in a stilt house down here. Cards will then get passed to Shize. She's also going to take a fisherman and place one of her shrines in the other stilt house to help out with uh, having some additional shrines there for the following years. Cards are then now going to get passed to Hala because Hala has a chain of two to Mizuchi's chain of nothing, and Hala's going to choose to take the Geisha. She's going to gain one favor, and this is going to give her one victory point at the end. So we move her favor track up one, and she'll have a victory point. Now we have the peasant left. Normally, the peasant would go to the player who is left over, in this case, Mizuchi. However, looking at the fishing village, there are no shrines for Mizuchi. Mizuchi has no presence in this village. So instead of this card going to Mizuchi, this card simply gets discarded back to the villager deck, and no one gains it. You have to have presence in the village in order to gain a villager. Finally, we move to the Holy Village. We have Ginsui with a chain of three shrines. Mizuchi and Shize each have a chain of two, with Mizuchi in the temple determining the tiebreaker. And then Hala has a couple of shrines in the village, but they're not adjacent to one another, so she's essentially going to get whatever's left over here. Ginsui takes the cards, and he takes a look here. We have the monk, which is going to grant him one nature and a victory point at the end of the game. We have the priest, which is going to grant three nature and three victory points at the end of the game, so a little bit better than the monk. The peasant makes another appearance in the holy village. And then you have the option of selecting the Yamabushi. Now the Yamabushi lets you add a shrine to a forest in this village, and there are two forests that are available here. So this would allow you to place a shrine in the for in an available forest, obviously granting the nature for placing there, and it's also worth two victory points at the end of the game. Looking at his options, Ginsui is going to take the priest. He's going to gain three nature, and he wants those three victory points at the end of the game. Next in line, we have a tie. Mizuchi and Shize each have two shrines. Mizuchi is in the temple, so she's going to choose herself to make the second pick. She is going to choose the Yamabushi so that she can add a shrine to a forest and gain two nature. This is also worth two victory points. So she's going to simply place here, gain her two nature. And then, of course, the Yamabushi is worth the two victory points at the end. Cards will then get passed to Shize, who is going to select the monk, gaining one nature and one in-game victory point. And then the leftover card, the lovely peasant, will get passed to Hala, and Hala will place that in her scoring area for end of game scoring. We now move on to the favor and nature tracks. End of year scoring is done by taking a look at each Kami's favor and nature tracks. The Kami will score the lowest of the two tracks. So we look at Hala. Hala has 10 favor and 10 nature. She has a perfectly balanced track. She's going to gain 10 points. Not for being perfectly balanced, but because each track is on 10. She scores the lower of the two. Her track then resets to zero once she's scored her end of year points. We look at Shize. Shize has five nature and six favor. So she's going to score again the lower of the two tracks, granting her five victory points for her nature track. And that will reset to zero. Looking at Ginsui, our red player. Ginsui did a fantastic job with nature, acquiring eight of the possible 12 that he can have. However, he only has three favor, so Ginsui, our red player, is only going to score three points for this year. His favor and nature tracks will also reset to the, for the end of the year. And we look at Mizuchi, who has five favor and five favor, five nature and seven favor. Again, five being the lowest, so she is going to score five victory points. This is the end of the year scoring. We reset the favor and nature tracks back to zero for all players. 
players will then acquire a fourth action cube. So each player would acquire a fourth cube, giving them an extra ability to be used in the second year of the game. The board is going to rotate one turn as well as the advent token passing one turn. This is going to make Shize, our player that was sitting on this side of the board, will be our new first player. Play will continue through a, another round of placing shrines where things get a little bit more cutthroat because the shrines are not removed from the board. So thing, people start removing and replacing shrines a lot more in year two and especially in year three. Board's gonna rotate as normal. It's gonna play exactly as the first round did. You're going to do another end of year scoring phase just like we did, so we'd be advanced at two. If anyone had cashed in any tokens, they would gain those points immediately. So, you know, maybe, say, Shize was able to gain her other two tokens, so she would immediately grab six. Hala did the same, so she grabbed six. You know, maybe Ginsui was able to grab six to get himself back in the game. Mizuchi didn't do so, because she only has two tokens at this point, and they're in the same village. So let's say this is how scoring was before, at the end of year two, from just cashing in tokens. Players would then do favor and nature tracks as normal. Uh, so again, scoring the lower of the two and adjusting their points accordingly. The board would rotate a third time, allowing everyone to take another set of turns with the board rotating and placing and removing shrines like normal using your special abilities. And then you, you then do another end of year scoring where you distribute the villagers. You score your favor and nature tracks at the end of year three. And then you go to end of game scoring. After completing end of year scoring for year number three, we move to end game scoring. End game scoring is done by a combination of the villagers that has been acquired by each kami, as well as the village tokens they've acquired throughout the game. Looking here is an example of the villagers that Hala acquired as she went through the game and traveled through the villages, spreading her influence, uh, as well as two village tokens. Uh, the easiest way to do end game scoring is to sort all of your villagers by end game victory points, indicated on the lower part of each card. So we have our one our one VP villagers, two VP villagers, three VP villagers, and our peasants that are worth half a VP each. So we go through and we count these up. Now we've already scored the other Kami abilities, or the other Kami scores for end of year as well as end of game, and hollow has got some ground to make up. So she's back here at 23 points while everybody up is around the 30 area uh, as well. But she adds up her villagers. We've got three one-point villagers, We've got four villagers that grant her two points each, so two, four, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven, plus another three will take her to 14 victory points. And she has four peasants that are each worth a half a victory point, so she's gonna get two more points, taking her to 16 total. And then each village token is also worth a victory point, so 16, 17, 18 points is going to jump her from 23 points up to 41 and propelling her to the victory. And that is how in-game scoring works for Kami-sama. We looked at four of the base game Kami, Hala, Shize, Mizuchi, and Ginsui. I want to talk briefly about the other four Kami because they introduce another mechanism into the game in the way some of the Kami work, and that is the introduction of tokens. So the four Kami that you see here, Ketsugetsu, our Rage Spirit, Daimok, our Tree Spirit, Kurori, our Fear Spirit, and Yue, the Moon Spirit. All introduce tokens. You'll notice on the board they each have a little bit of a distinction to them. Karore has a fear token on the lower part of her board, as well as a fear track. Likewise, Ketsugetsu has a rage track with a rage token, both set at the zero place for both of these kami where they start at the beginning of the game. Yue has, starts the game with four moon tokens, and Daymok will start the game with four seed tokens. These tokens are used throughout the game to do various things, and they play into the Kami abilities here. For example, Karare starts the game with a fear token on the zero space. By using some of her abilities, she earns fear points, or basically just fear, that she then spends later to activate other abilities. So for example, her manifest ability, she gets to add a shrine in her current village and gain a fear. So it's much like the regular add or remove a shrine in the current village, except she gains a fear token, or gains a, a one fear, so she simply ticks her fear token up to the one space. She could also use this manifest ability, instead of adding a shrine to gain a fear, she could spend two fear to add a shrine to any village, so it allows her to play outside of her village. Using the Frighten ability, she can move an opponent's shrine that's adjacent to one of her shrines to another village and gain a fear, 
or she can spend two fear to remove a shrine in any village. So again, being able to use the add or remove ability in any village and not just her current one. And then her two action cube power down here, Torment, allows her to replace an opponent's shrine in any village and gain a fear. Or she can spend four fear to replace two shrines in any village. So she could take two shrines away from an opponent, pop her own shrines in their place. So throughout the game, she's going to be gaining fear and spending fear to activate her special abilities. Daymox tokens work a little bit differently. He starts the game with four seed tokens, and whenever he uses his adder, whenever he adds a shrine in a forest on the board, so those cherry blossom spaces that grant two nature, obviously he still gets the two nature for doing that, but he's able to add one of his four seed tokens to a hut or a stilt house. Those seeds do not, those seed tokens do not count as shrines. Uh, for in terms of completing the patterns, but they can be removed as if they were shrines. So an opponent could use the add or remove shrine ability to remove Daymox seed tokens from the board. These seed tokens then play into Daymox abilities. His first ability, Sprout, allows him to replace all seed tokens with shrines in any one village. So he can. This is a, a great way to throw shrines out on the board really quickly and complete patterns without without your opponents really knowing uh, what's happened. Uh, and for each seed token that gets replaced in this way, Daymok will gain one favor or one nature. His second ability, Overgrowth, allows him to remove a seed token in any village to remove up to two adjacent shrines. And any opponents, any opponents who have shrines removed in this way will gain one nature. So a quick way for Daymok to wipe out his opponent's shrines. And then his last ability, Mulch, allows him to replace an opponent's shrine with a seed token in any village. So again, he could Mulch, get rid of the opponent's shrine, add a seed token, and then use his Sprout ability later to then put one of his shrines into place. So there's some strategy that goes there. Yue has four tokens as well, but her four tokens work a little differently. At the start of each, uh, each year, she's going to reveal one of her moon tokens. Each of these moon tokens corresponds to a, another villa, to one of the four villages on the board. This token, if this is the token she's revealed for the start of the first year, this allows her to count the fishing village as her current village, even if it's not the village she's currently sitting in front of. So Yue has the ability to potentially be playing in two villages on each in each year because the moon casts a light over the villages and she's able to see more of the board. So her tokens work a little differently. They don't actually play into her abilities. They do allow her to count possibly two villages as her current village. So she would have, let's say she's sitting in front of the wealthy village and she reveals this fishing village token. Now she can do her basic abilities, uh, her add remove shrine ability, as well as her blanket of night, lunar pole and eclipse. Um, those are all set in the current village. Her current village in this example would count as the wealthy village as well as the fishing village. At the next, th this token would then go away. She would, at the start of the second year, reveal another token, again, potentially playing in two villages. And then that token would go away. And then for year three, she would reveal a third token. So the whole time she has the ability to possibly be playing in two villages. Looking at Ketsugetsu, our rage spirit, he begins the game with a rage token on the zero space of his rage track. And after a player removes one of Ketsugetsu's shrines, he gets a little angry. So when that happens uh, from any village, he gains a rage. So if, he, if someone removes a shrine, he ticks one up on the rage track. He then is able to spend uh, his rage, or as he's, as he's removing shrines or getting his shrines removed, his rage builds up. Whenever he hits the fourth space on the rage track, the rage track gets set to zero, and he removes a shrine adjacent to one of his own shrines in his current village. So as you remove uh, his shrines, he gets madder and madder. Once the track gets topped out at four, it resets to zero, and he removes shrines that are adjacent to his shrines. His abilities uh, also allow him to gain the rage to help him climb that rage track a little bit faster. So his first ability, Kata, lets him add a shrine to a hut or stilt house in any village and gain one rage so that he can, he can make himself angry. Using the soul cut, he will remove one of the shrines in his current village and replace an opponent's shrine in another village. And his two action cube ability, Blood Moon, 
removes a shrine in a field, forest, or temple in the current village, and at least one of the shrines removed in this way must belong to you, so you have to remove one of your own shrines, and you'll gain one rage. So let's him pop a couple of shrines out there uh, and, and, and climb that rage track even faster. So these are the other four kami in the base game of Kami-sama that introduce token play, and I thought it was important to show how those tokens work and give you an idea of how these four kami differ from the four that we saw during the gameplay example.